colleague and obesity physician and clinical endocrinologist, the brainchild of uh, Dr. Supratik Bhattacharya. Uh, would invite Dr. Supratik Bhattacharya to come over the stage and ignite this discussion and start the session. Over to you, Dr. Supratik Bhattacharya. You know, always a charming young boy, <laughs> we can say. Yeah. Over to you. Thank you, brother, for all of these kind words of introduction and a warm welcome to all of you who has joined here with uh, special interest in obesity. And we'll also be focusing on the need to treat obesity during pregnancy and thereafter. So I'm delighted to invite my friends and colleagues who have been integral part of this MOS. And uh, may I please request one by one, can I have Dr. Arun Raghavan on stage, please? Then may I have Dr. Nandita Arun next uh, on, on the seat, please? <laughs> Dr. Kaushik Saha. So as you, as the speakers are coming up and the panelists are coming up, you can see the introduction slide on the board. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Next, can I have Dr. Amit De? I'll get a better introduction. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then Dr. Alok Modi. And finally, Dr. Shubhra Jyoti Ghosh. And May I also say Dr. Ruddul and Dr. Dharmendra Pachal who is like instrumental in uh, organizing PhD. Uh, they are also part of this MOS family and we'd love to have them on and off uh, for this conversation. So uh, a welcome to all of you. Just a quick word regarding uh, what MOS is all about. It's called Association of Metabolic Obesity Physicians and Clinical Endocrinologists. So like-minded people, Across India, we formed a group. The idea is to, uh, you know, concentrate on multicentric research uh, in regards to obesity, metabolic medicine, and endocrine medicine, and also focus on academics. So this remains the primary goal for us. And last year, we had the first national obesity conference, and it was a grand success, and we hope to take this forward in future as well. So we'll keep this a very interactive session and we have an excellent panel who has been dealing with obesity for a very long time and they will share their practical experiences and um, I will start from my extreme um, left and then onwards we will come uh, near me as we go along. Okay, so may we start with Dr. Alok Modi, he is from Thane and um, he has been instrumental in sort of advocating AI, uh, artificial intelligence in management of various diseases, including diabetes and obesity. So Dr. Alok Modi, uh, the first question to you, um, very briefly, if you can talk to us about how we can use AI in obesity. Okay, so first of all, uh, very good morning and a lot of thanks to the organizers and Bansi sir for inviting me here and respects to the organizing chairman and the panel over here. So AI is artificial intelligence and it is creeping in every walk of our life. One thing about uh, LMS, large language models in AI is that in obesity, you collect data, you treat the patient, right? It's, it's a lot of this thing is monitoring of the patient. So you collect the weight, you collect the calorie intake. You collect the exercise. So you're collecting the exercise performance through the smartwatch. You're collecting the caloric intake through probably your Google Lens where you can take the photograph of the food plate and calculate the calorie and put it in your Android phone or your iOS. And then you're taking the lab values. So there are different operating systems and how do you integrate them and how do you work. So just to give an example, we all say that the weather report is very inaccurate. You know, when they predict it will be rainfall, there is no rainfall and vice versa. That's because you know in computers we're dealing with two languages. 
where is in real life you're dealing with multiple variables i'm still sorry we're dealing with two variables zero and one but in real life you're dealing with multiple variables so how does a human brain a clinician comprehend all the data pull it together and makes logical sense out of it and then predict what treatment or what lifestyle would be good this is where llm said lots of data quickly processed from in interoperability systems who are not able to talk to each other make sense out of it and give a proper prognostic and therapeutic guidance what should be done in the patient that is where ai helps immensely and very important second part is patient empowerment the ai tool is there on your mobile so it can talk to the patient directly and give outputs to the patient so a lot of your work is done so and it's prognostically and therapeutically very useful it gives you ideas which is good and it can predict what will happen after six months to one year and something more than that today's patients are google patients they believe what they see on the phone rather than what you talk so the output comes on your phone patient follows it that is what i call patient empowerment especially in diabetes i found something beautiful lifestyle management works much better than AI does it. you do it though you are the brains behind here getting it done in right. short, we will yeah but so we will stop there and then we'll come back to you uh, on elaboration on how we can use this for management of obesity and uh, diabetes in particular but before that uh, what really is obesity may I ask uh, dr Amit. okay so basically uh, by definition if you look at then obesity is increase in bmi and uh, that is, of course, for our um, Asian population, we'll take the cutoff as 23, beyond which we call it overweight. And uh, uh, for the rest of the world, it's, of course, over 25. But, of course, uh, the obesity has various categories like the grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3, which is of BMI more than 30. So that is just to give the basic definition. So we have a different definition for the Asian individual. So if the global standard is more than 25, that's defining them as overweight, we have a lower cutoff value for the Asian individuals. Okay, uh, that's what we wanted to emphasize here. That's what Dr. Amit wanted to emphasize. We'll take that further, but is it always about the BMI or is it something else that defines um, whether we need to treat the patient or we can just let them be? Okay, Dr. Koshin, yes. The thing is that as uh, Dr. Uh, they say, uh, only doing the BMI, the assessment of obesity is incomplete. I think if you see that as the cutoff value for the Asian subcontinent is around 23, why it is? I think because of the obesity, obesity there is a fat accumulation in different areas. For example, the visceral obesity as well as the parental obesity. If the patient does have the visceral obesity is more, in spite of the BMI is around 25, I think we can have a complications of all the complications of the obesity in 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 uh, in our subsets. So that's why uh, in Asian subcontinent the incidence of visceral visceral obesity is very high. That's why we have to bring the BMI value around 23. And apart from that, that the OST ratio as well as the OST height ratio is also important to assess the obesity. Only doing the BMI, I think we can miss the bus in different areas. The lean, obese, lean patients who are actually having the all the complications of the metabolic complication, having the visceral fats, and we 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 are not able to measure the visceral fats in every individual because it is very cumbersome as well as the costly. So it is not possible on the regular basis to do the BMI, uh, sorry, the visceral fat estimations. That's why, apart from the BMI, I think we have to include certain other parameters like waste ratio as well as the waste height ratio in our clinical practice. Absolutely. So uh, going to Nandita, we want to understand that does all, you know, overweight or obese uh, person require treatment? Is there something called, uh, you know, a metabolically healthy versus metabolically unhealthy obesity? Sure. So um, I think uh, the discussion about BMI and the cutoff BMI being lower for Asians has already been established. The reason being that we have a lower threshold for insulin resistance as compared to the Caucasian, which is why our threshold itself is, uh, cutoff itself is lower. Now, having said that, by definition, obesity cannot be defined just based on BMI because BMI alone uh, may not 
pick up people who are metabolically unhealthy, is it, which is what has been discussed so far. Beyond this, there are a subset of people by definition of BMI who are overweight and yet are metabolically healthy. And this is what is called the metabolically healthy obese, right, or the MHO. And what this means is by definition of body mass index, they are overweight or obese. However, they do not have the other cardiovascular risk factors of metabolic syndrome, for example, dyslipidemia, dysglycemia or IGD or hypertension. So just by definition of BMI, they are obese. However, they are metabolically healthy. And why this is important is, is because there may be in contrast the so-called thin fat Indian, someone by definition of BMI who is actually having a normal BMI and yet may be metabolically unhealthy, right? So a person who has um, normal BMI and just because they do not have the cardiovascular risk factors of dyslipidemia and dysglycemia and hypertension or the so-called metabolically healthy obese individuals, although they do not have these risk factors, they still do have cardiovascular risk because of their um, excess body fat. Having said this, one of the points to remember is these people who are metabolically healthy may not have more of visceral fat, they have more of subcutaneous fat, they have preserved beta cell function, they have lesser amount of insulin resistance, maybe not leading to dysglycemia. Should we treat them is the next question. And the answer to that is probably yes, because this phase of metabolically health, healthy obesity may actually be transient and there is data to show that pe people who are metabolically healthy obese may progress towards dysglycemia and insulin resistance and diabetes. Perfect. So uh, we will come back to uh, the treatment options very soon but before that we will try and go back a little bit and try and understand about childhood obesity. So um, if uh, I may ask uh, uh, Dr. Arundu, please. Yeah, childhood obesity, as we know, is a huge concern, huge growing problem, not just globally, also in India. And we've seen, uh, as per the CDC guidelines, any percentile over 85, based on the growth charts, is considered overweight, and a percentile over the 95 percent is uh, considered obese. So, childhood obesity also progresses later on to obesity which has growing problems. I think we all highlighted about how important obesity is, uh, how important it is to address obesity. The other concerns about obesity is obesity itself landing up not just into metabolic diseases, but also other diseases like obstructive sleep apnea and cardiovascular diseases, stroke, later on osteoarthritis, and also linked to many cancers, including you know endometrial carcinomas, as well as gallbladder cancers, so on and so forth. And later on, not to mention about the low self-esteem, depression, productivity that impacts one's life. Right? So childhood obesity is perhaps the area where we need to look at, focus, probably a lot of involve a lot of psychologists also into the fray and then definitely make a difference. I think there are also other reasons contributing to childhood obesity. We've spoken about industrialization, urbanization. I think a lot has to do with also digitization. Today, children are glued on to their phones. Everybody orders through apps. They are all, you know, touch of a button, you get everything done. And today's games are extremely engaging. So children do not go outside and play. We seldom see children going outside and, outside and play. So we have to make a conscious decision to educate children and to also ask them to go out and play and, you know, make them be physically active to kind of mitigate childhood obesity. Absolutely. Perfect. So I think there was a concept a few years back, if you had asked that obesity is not our problem. Obesity has been a problem of the Western world. But now we know for sure that in India, this is as relevant as the Western population. So may I please ask Dr. Shubhrajuti to um, you know, elaborate on what do you think is the magnitude of the problem that we have regarding obesity in India? Uh, with uh, westernizations of Indian cultures, what we have seen is that the rising prevalence of obesity. So we are not only fighting against uh, diabetes, we can say the obesity is then part of metabolic syndrome and we have really seen there is a rising uh, epidemic of metabolic syndromes also across uh, India. So if we look into about the magnitudes of uh, this obesity, like we can say uh, in our households where like we always used to have a, a habit of um, Chumpy babies like are good having a good health, but this is really not the fact. So what we know that if we have to really look into, we don't have ex exact data also regarding like obesity 
uh, prevalence in India. But if you will uh, go through it with our own observations, we will find like one out of every three or four Indians, whether like they are thin built Indians, whether they are like uh, metabolically active or inactive, you will find that one out of every three or four are really they are obese in either of the parameters if you calculate it uh, with proper calculations. Thank you. Perfect. So it's a pleasure to have our brother, uh, Dr. Bhagat Sabu, all the way from Indore. And um, um, to you, the first question will be, thank you for making it to the panel. Uh, thank you for having an early flight. And the question to you is, you know, like whenever a person walks into our clinic and we look at them, we already had, you know, made up our mind that probably this person is eating too much. So is obesity all about, you know, uh, eating too much or are there any other factors that are involved like genetics and environmental factors that we need to address? Uh, this is a very important question. First of all, I'm very thankful that you people incorporated me in this, in, in this very important symposium because obesity is uh, threatening us like anything and it is threatening because it is having multifactorial origin to it. It is not only diet but lack of activity which is mainly contributing along with it adding to the genetics so we are genetically predisposed to uh, deposit fat in our bodies just like nandita told we have excess fat in our bodies no matter how lean we are we have some amount of visceral fat within us so this thing is actually multifactorial we need to address when a patient comes to us we need to first of all don't tell him that he is overweight uh, we should always ask him that are you concerned about your weight because it is his choice and his prerogative first of all you should give him a first chance to admit that he is overweight once he admits it our job becomes much more easier it is a cakewalk then if he doesn't admit to it then we have all our ways we are doctors and we know how to lure him into it that you are overweight so this is how a conversation should begin when the patient should come then we should talk about all the risk factors which are involved Obviously, genetics should not be talked to patient in my view because then patient blames it on genetics and then he starts avoiding what he is doing wrong. So, he should be actually cornered upon where we want to corner him because uh, setting up him up for a diet and lifestyle is the toughest thing you and me will agree to it is to do to a patient. Since this platform is PhD, uh, we will have one or two questions that are relevant to pregnancy uh, as well and diabetes. And in that context, may I please ask uh, Dr. Alok, um, these are two very closely related questions. So the first part is, is there any evidence that obese mother gave birth to obese babies? Uh, second is, do big babies born to poorly controlled gestational diabetes mothers grow up to be obese individuals? Yes, I think that was very beautifully answered by Shishu. Shishas are upstairs, we just attended that session. So basically, there is this concept of fetal prime. So people in India, especially relevant for us, undernourished So these are the people who have not got enough nourishment. So what happens is, the fetus in utero is primed to think that this is the amount of nourishment I will get throughout my life. And so he's exposed to overnutrition. That leads to childhood obesity, that is one thing. And people who are overnourished in pregnancy, or obviously this time. So what happens is when there is hyperglycemia, so what happens is there is increased insulin which moves into the plasma in the fetal body. That causes more amount of obesity because insulin is a, like an anabolic hormone. Right? It's an anabolic hormone. It starts developing the child. And this starts at a very early age from organogenesis age. So this child has sort of got a genetic primed. He's got a blueprint to come out with obesity. So his body is being told. This is something which I have read and I have understood. A very beautiful concept. I just shared it here. So you know. You can ask this question. We have a lot of proteins in our body, but we never mount an immune reaction to our own proteins. Why? The moment we get a transplant, our body can identify this as self and also. So that's the priming. So these are the people who are primed from their in utero that this is your normal video. So obesity is a primed normal video for this child. So he's destined to be a obese child. So it's like a it's like an environmental created genetic child who's an obese child. So that is what happens. So all the more reason what Dr. Bharat very rightly said, something most important here is not medicine, it's education completion. Giving them a right atmosphere is more important if we want to prevent these complications. And this is one of the major reasons India is developing childhood obesity, not because they're eating junk diet. Yeah. So uh, going to Dr. Abhi, 
want to ask you, so what is the best lifestyle and diet advice that we can uh, give to those obese individuals who are trying to address the weight? So before we get into that, first of all, we all must understand and acknowledge that obesity is a disease. And that is, that is something which is very important because like every other disease, this is a chronic condition that needs to be continuously treated. That is also something very important for us to understand. Now, when you talk about the, the modalities of treatment, of course, we have the lifestyle therapies and the dietary advices that needs to be given besides the pharmacotherapies and the uh, interventions which can be done in the form of surgeries or any balloon procedure. So in the lifestyle therapy, uh, the most important thing is uh, if the person needs to be given a target, that is first of all very important. You need to set a target and a goal. So if the person is having a certain weight, we set a target for that individual to achieve in say, let's say in the next three months or the next six months. And then in terms of the lifestyle, of course, you encourage the individual to exercise, mobilize himself. Uh, again, there has to be a separate exercise prescription given to every obese individual. It's just not like an advice given just for brisk walking 30 minutes a day or do some uh, strenuous activity or resistance training exercise because for every individual, their physical capabilities will be different and they will also be having associated comorbidities which might be a hindrance to the, to the exercise that is being advised to them. So an exercise prescription is of course very important and that should predominantly be focused into doing more of uh, aerobics exercise, more of calorie burning exercises and then going into a little bit of resistance training and anaerobic exercise to kind of once you lose the fat mass to tone up the muscles because the whole concept of losing weight is about the balance of the calorie intake and the and the calorie output so one very important thing is to go with the exercise prescription which should be actually given by every clinician or every lifestyle therapist when they're advising it the second part about diet is again the type of eating is very going to be very important whether we are asking the individual to go for a calorie restricted diet or time restricted eating. So all that needs to be specified, but you know, that is again, very individualized. Uh, calorie will be of course given to the individual based on that individual patient profile. and So the associated comorbid condition that he or she has, if the individual has diabetes along with this. So of course the diet is going to be more of a diabetic diet. Uh, and also the capability to which the individual can follow. So it has to be very, very individualized, but time restricted eating and calorie restricted eating is that's exactly what is going to be my second question uh, to Dr. Kaushik. That you know, some people say that I'm happy with intermittent fasting, and uh, some people they want to go in for like calorie restricted diet. So, um, how do you prescribe uh, these diets to the individuals, and how do you decide? Is it based on the patient's choices, or you customize based on the needs? Exactly. Nowadays, I think we are very much known about the intermittent fasting. I think it's a very, very burning topic nowadays. That is called the time-based uh, dietary restrictions. Now, thing is that uh, there are different studies have been done regarding whether this time-based or the calorie-based, which was which is very good as far as the management of the obesity is concerned. I think it has been seen that. The calorie-based things, uh, which is a more and more uh, having a valid reasons for the management of obesity, because in long run, I think calorie-based has got a definite role regarding the reduced incidence of any cardiovascular activity and more mobility, mortality, as well as the type of diabetes and all these things. But the thing is that if you're combining this time-based with the calorie-based, then the chances of reducing the obesity is more. But reducing the obesity does not transform into the uh, reducing the uh, comorbidities like the cardiovascular mortality as well as the type 2 diabetes. So my advice will be don't go for only the time-based. I think it is the combination of the time-based along with the calorie-based will be the much more, much more appreciated in the long run in the management of any morbidity because you know that why we are talking about the obesity because obesity is the forerunner of the metabolic diseases. If we are not able to control the forerunner of the diseases by doing certain maneuvers, like only the time based, I think we are missing the bus. So that's why my recommendation to the house is that 
don't go for only the intermittent fasting intermittent fasting either the 16 8 or the uh, 14 uh, 14 8 or 16 uh, 6 whatever maybe the things along with that you have to combine with the calorie restrictions so that is my advice from my chair and because at the end i think we should aim to control the cardiovascular mobility control the incidence of type 2 diabetes control the other comorbidities but don't forget the importance of the calorie restriction in your diet i think it's fair to say that if we can start losing about 10 percent of the body weight or more we're doing a lot of good to the organs in our body and that's a good starting point you know so going from there i've asked a very difficult question to dr nandita now some people just walk into your clinic and they know that they would want to lose weight but some people when you talk to them, uh, they say that, you know, I'm happy to do the lifestyle, diet, etc. Other people say that, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take some treatment from you. You advise medications. And I'm happy to do that. But I'm going to eat rasgullas. I'm going to eat, you know, like whatever I want to eat. But still, I, I, I'm paying for it. So I want to lose weight. So uh, how do you handle this? And uh, do we have evidence that uh, lifestyle and uh, diet Versus those who are only on pharmacotherapy without lifestyle and diet, do we do we have any evidence that one works better than the other? Right. Uh, yes, that is a tough question. But I think a simple answer to it is that there is no replacement when it comes to lifestyle modification. Um, that's the most straightforward way to answer it. And I think that's something we need to make our patients aware of as well. And uh, pretty straightforward, tell them up front that um, there are no shortcuts. Um, yes, there is supportive therapy and any pharmacotherapy is of course probably equally powerful when you combine it uh, as a supportive therapy with your LSM. But um, only pharmacotherapy, for example, if a person is going to be taking an anti-obesity drug and continuing to eat their gulab jamuns and uh, rasgullas, um, at the end of it, they, it, that's probably going to be further driving them towards insulin resistance and um, diabetes in the future. So I think that's something we need to educate our patients about. Having said that, I think some of the drugs, of course, like GLP-1 analogs, um, do have the added benefit of appetite suppression. So um, that also probably has some role in assisting with diet restriction. But um, I think the simple way to answer it is that although pharmacotherapy is powerful, um, lifestyle modification is essential to achieve targets and uh, that's something we do need to make our patients understand. Perfect. So going to Dr. Arun, um, I know that in India at the moment, you know, standing today, we are a bit limited in the space of having molecules which only target obesity, you know, like, but globally there is a lot of research that is ongoing at the moment and some of them which has shown very, very, you know, encouraging results like Cagrisima for one has shown weight reduction capability of almost 30 percent which is equivalent to a pediatric surgery so if you just highlight what are the kind of molecules we're looking into the future uh, which we can expect within the next say uh, five years or so Krishna is one as you rightly pointed out i think the glp1 receptor agonist the next generation glp1 receptor agonist even uh, including the uh, rita 2 trial the triple agonist is showing about 30 to 35 percent weight reduction perhaps i don't think anybody would even opt for bariatric surgery in the future bariatric surgery would be something of the past once these next generation glp1 agonists come into the fray how i think we are still uh, short of ozenpex or in fact uh, even the uh, uh, sex centers for that matter three milligram of liraglutide is not approved in india we do not have approval of usage of liraglutide itself for obesity in india Similarly, we do not have the advantage of the injectable semaglutide in India. I think that's something that we have to get these drugs as fast as possible because we know the Hollywood phenomena happening in the Western world. There is no molecules for injectable semaglutides both in the US as well as, uh, as, well as in the uh, Europe. And of course, uh, the terzipetide also has shown some robust uh, reduction. And of course, we have the other uh, drugs such as the uh, sympathomimetic amines, uh, such as uh, benzphetamines is there. And then we have uh, the fendimetrazine. So these are also agents which are centrally acting, which could limit your appetite. So these are new agents that we can look forward to. Perfect, perfect. So um, going to Dr. Ghosh, 
we quickly want to learn about you know what are the pharmacotherapies that are approved in patients right now in India for treating obesity who do not have diabetes. So only treating obesity. So let me talk about treating obesity in India. Uh, we have very limited choices. All of that one is uh, all listed. We already have it, and uh, as per, uh, despite all listed, we can also use the regulated in our daily uh, uh, treatment to treat obesity in India. I have to say that, that we are just waiting for uh, the clearance for the newer generation of drugs so that we can use on our regular treatment in India. So, as we said, you know, we have a lot of things that are ongoing at the moment in terms of research and they are very exciting molecules. The only thing is that we don't have the approved doses of those molecules. For example, liraglutide, as Dr. Arun said, uh, in 3 milligram doses, which is called Saxenda, never came to India. Okay. And then we go with this another a molecule once weekly semen blue diet which has been approved for weight management is very very popular across the globe and all the celebrities are taking it unfortunately we are not going to get that in india either uh, we are going to get it but uh, not before 2025 for that matter so we have to wait another year before we go we reaches us so uh, i think we are just limited and as dr Ghosh said it's only uh, the only step that is available for weight reduction in those with pure obesity without any diabetes for that matter. So now going to Dr. Bharat, again, what big concern is, uh, and very recently there has been a coin, uh, term that has been coined, which is called diabetes. Now, uh, would you like to uh, elaborate on diabetes, please? Uh, this term has been coined because we see a hand-in-glove sort of relationship between diabetes and obesity. So they both go uh, in a similar fashion, diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, which is mainly due to insulin resistance, predisposes person for obesity. And then secondly, due to obesity, we have a high amount of visceral fat, which again amounts to insulin resistance, and this is a vicious cycle. So patient never gets out of it unless he tries very hard and uh, he sticks to the protocols which are there. So this is a term uh, devised to denote these two conditions which go hand in hand, and that is why the both the terms are mixed and this is known as diabetes these days. So, so uh, look, uh, we want to understand, you know, like uh, so many times the patient comes to you and is sitting across the table, you know, he has come, he or she has come for something else. Very frequently what we get is a person who it would be coming to you with subclinical uh, hypothyroid state and would be saying to you that, you know, like it's my thyroid which is causing all the weight gain, you know, like, uh, so, so you need to counsel the, the patient understands that she wants to lose weight. She, that's, that's where she's coming from. So how do you start the conversation with this person? That's a very practically relevant question. Thank you. Uh, one thing, uh, when we attend uh, the obesity seminars today, the word obesity has been sort of removed and today we are supposed to address these people as people with obesity. So yeah. PWO, we don't call them obese or fat people. So like we have always been taught from our undergraduate days, we need to be empathetic, we can't be apathetic and sympathetic. So when uh, the best way to treat lifestyle and empower the patient to relate with you is let the patient be willing and let the patient understand. 95% of the patients want to treat their obesity, either secondary obesity, like you said, hypothyroidism or primary, but they don't know how to go about it, they're confused. And when you talk to them, because they've already done a lot of body shaming with their relatives and also they're scared to talk to you and open up to you. So what I do is, I don't touch the tender point in the first visit, I let them pour out. I, I like to listen more than rather than talk to them, get them to talk and I schedule a meeting uh, subsequently after listening to them and then I sort of do a hand lifting. I just I can use a lot of PR and tools to empower them because what I think goes on the uh, digital platform is more uh, something they can accept rather than me talk to them and speak about them. And something which I found in my practice which works very well is I like to address a group of patients in a seminar rather than an individual. So when I talk to them on a uh, platform level, at a group level, with social support and all, then what happens is when their relatives are involved, and when one patient is talking about his concerns about obesity, 10 other people are coming out with similar problems. And then my job becomes very easy. The eye gets broken. And when they can correlate, something they have learned from Alcoholic Anonymous, when they all talk about the same problem together, they really break the ice. They get very friendly and comfortable with you. And subsequently, India may come you know, getting a doctor free of cost for one hour. Otherwise, your doctor was never available for that much money for one hour. So that breaks the ice. And once the 
bonding is established between you and the patient a lot of things move move ahead and i realize one more point which helps a lot in my practice is rather than bond with the patient start bonding with the family members if you can bond with the spouse the in-laws the mother-in-law especially in certain patients then a lot of success comes because then they really listen to you they look up to you and they follow you and and behind the curtain i let the ai do the work yeah, but I, I like to note, I want to share, like, you know, like a person came to me concerned about the body weight and when she started losing weight, the husband was concerned that I like my wife the way she was before, you know, like I don't want to lose any weight. So, so there are always concerns. You have to ask the expectation of the family person as well and Dr. Anupati was asking. So, yeah. No, but just, just I bring the thing. There are a lot of studies on, there are, there's a ton of literature and I think uh, Dr. Mansitar and Dr. Kalre published a lot of papers if you go through the literature. But what I found most important is from my understanding, if I'm talking practically, is most of these patients who come to you are under a lot of guilty feeling because they have been done a lot of body shaming at work from their colleagues, from their families, and distant relatives. And body shaming really kills them. And when you start talking, they get scared and they run away from you. So when you welcome them and you say, hey, I'm here to treat your body and you're not to be blamed. It's like insulin, you know, it's like, I will give you insulin if you don't take medicine, they, they run away. Absolutely. If you tell them it's physiological, it is not a crime. You are not responsible for obesity. Your lifestyle is responsible. You know, if you are a CFO for a company which works in the night in US, so you get up in the night you're taking 10 cups of coffee because of your lifestyle. I cannot blame you. A truck driver, Dr. Kalra told me, Dr. Yasinja Kalra told me that he's on the road for three days. He doesn't get to eat except junk food and coffee and tea. So when you tell them to put that easy say you're not to be blamed, then they bond with you and then they really listen to you, which is what I, I agree. And this conversation has to be brought up uh, pretty gently and this is probably one of the soft skill we want to develop so we intend to have more practical workshops on these kind of conversations uh, and we'll do that very soon for you and before that we'll go to dr amit uh, this is a very delicate question because we are on the platform of psg so uh, we can very commonly you'll see uh, patients who are concerned about the weight coming to you uh, intending to conceive uh, so how do you go about it? You know, like, would you be, uh, you know, making them wait, trying to lose some weight before they conceive? Or would you ask them that you conceive right away and then we'll look after the weight after the baby has been uh, delivered? So how would you go about it? So I think this is a very relevant point, but, but the sad part is uh, preconceptional counseling is not very strong in our country. And that's predominantly the reason and why we have an event like this is because there is very little collaboration between obstetricians or and metabolic physicians working together hand in hand. But let's presume a patient coming to me uh, prior to planning to conceive and uh, of course looking for a better metabolic health. I think most of us have observed that because of the hormonal changes of pregnancy, your patient is going to put on weight by at least a 5 to 7% of weight gain is going to happen, uh, you know, after pregnancy in the postpartum period. So if your patient is overweight and is having obesity, maybe grade 1 or grade, grade 2, I would say overweight and grade 1, then you would definitely encourage the patient to go for some significant lifestyle changes, dietary modifications lose some weight unless there is some pressing uh, issue like they are planning for an IVF, etc. So I guess preconception counseling is a very important part also in obesity care. I think that is that is. I think segment. you brought up a very important yes. uh, fact. I was just going to ask you about that because many of these patients would come to you because they are undergoing IVF yes. and, and, and the, the gynecologist would have told that, you know, the outcome is not going to be as great if you are not losing some amount of weight. Absolutely. So, so what, where does your priority lie and how would you, uh, you know, pursue? Because a person who is undergoing IVF is, is probably, in, uh, you know, pressed to conceive. Yes. But at the same time, uh, he, uh, she understands and the family understands that the weight loss is going to be helpful. Uh, during the pregnancy and thereafter. So, uh, so what would you want to so, do at that so point? So that's what is that, that the preconception counseling is very very crucial in patients planning to undergo IVF treatment because any IVF pregnancy is a precious pregnancy. So I think uh, the first important thing is there has to be a good sync between uh, the IVF specialist or the gynecologist and the and the treating metabolic physician as to what should be the right time give certain targets to the patient, have the patient synced with a good dietitian, 
who can help the patient lose some, some weight, uh, make the patient undergo some uh, proper exercise regime. And then if things are all good in place from the gynex point of view, you can have an ideal plan for an IDF being done. But having said that, the practical thing is patients come to us saying, I'm just saying this in terms of even diabetes. You know, patient comes to us saying that tomorrow is my ETI and I need my sugars control. That's that's the way it happens in our day-to-day -day practice. And you get very little time to actually take the patient through that preconception counseling period. That's why I think for every uh, gynecologist, whenever they're planning for an IVF pregnancy, if the patient is on the overweight and obese side, it's best we can go around with a metabolic physician, have the patient do some weight, which in majority of the cases, lifestyle modification, dietary restrictions would do good, at least the individual would lose 5 to 7 percent of the body weight, and then when the circumstance is ideal, you can, you can plan for it, the outcome would definitely be much better. Yeah, so one thing that I would like to consider is whether the person is, you know, uh, elderly, primary, you know, like, and how soon they want to conceive. Because if we feel that, you know, pregnancy is the priority, then we need to acknowledge that. And, but if you do have some amount of time, as Dr. Amit said, the ideal uh, way to go about is to lose a certain amount of weight before they conceive. And you have to, you know, sort of, you know, emphasize on the fact that they need to use contraceptives uh, during the time that, uh, you know, uh, they're undergoing weight management uh, treatment. So, going to Dr. Kaushik, uh, um, very quickly, we want to understand, you know, like, if somebody wants to open up an obesity clinic, how would you want to go about it? Okay. Uh, very difficult, but very easy. Because you, you know that there are a lot of things has to be done regarding the obesity claim. But before that, I want to say something regarding that. Bobby said regarding the, uh, the preconception of uh, weight gains and all these things. I think the different studies have been documented that if uh, before pregnancy, if the body weight of the mother is more, there is an increased incidence of the childhood obesity. So that's why we should give more importance to the mother to say that before any pregnancy, I think the weight reduction is one of the important issues. So number one. Number two that uh, both, as far as, because it is a pregnancy study group, so probably, okay. it is a pregnancy study group, so the more we should talk about the pregnancy related issues and all these things, rather than the only the obesity, right? The so thing is that if the baby weight is more, that means the macrosomia, then there is the increased chances of the child obesity in the later parts. The opposite is also true. If there is a small part gestational babies or the uh, premature babies, they also have been associated with the increased amount of weight gain in the childhood. So this is absolutely a contradictory thing. That means the low birth weight as well as the high birth weight is always associated with the childhood obesity. Another issue is that if the breastfeeding is done adequately, I think uh, the Childhood obesity, the incidence of childhood obesity is on the going, on the downside when the baby is actually having the breastfeeding. So this is a very important aspect as far as the pregnancy is concerned. Now regarding the obesity clinic. Okay, there are certain areas that means there is a, on a caption called the SMART clinic. That means S-M-A-R-T. That is S stands for the series and all these things. That means you have to give the equipment and all these things. Aim for the management skill, that means you have got a team of physicians as well as the uh, dietitians or the nutritionists as well as the physiotherapist, physiotherapist as well as uh, the other team works like palliative surgeons and all these things. So there is a teamwork. It's not that individual, uh, uh, only the metabolic surgeon or metabolic physicians are quite enough or uh, capable of doing these obesity clinic running and all these things. So it's a teamwork. So management team has to be there. Then A stands for the algorithms. That means you have to create certain, certain algorithm for the management of obesity. That means uh, when the patient comes to your clinic, you, what are the things you have to assess? That means the BMI as well as the waist tip ratio and all these parameters has to be checked. Then we have to check the socioeconomic conditions and what are the diets at least appropriate regarding the diseases that patient is actually having. Then we have to go for the SMART-R, 
that means either the research or any referral to the uh, uh, patients to the obesity uh, that means surgeons for the bariatric surgery or things and last is the T that means the technology or the therapy part technology as Dr. Uh, uh, Gupta says that means we will take a technology yeah, 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 as a separate it's, question it's, that yeah. it's it's the the smart technique has to be done for the obesity clinic done that means it's not that you have to start with only treating the patients with the pharmacotherapy you have to have a team approach and team approach consists of the all the parameters in your clinic to have a team. <laughs> So I think that's perfect. So multidisciplinary approach is what we want to have. Last questions to uh, Dr. Arun and, Nan, uh, and uh, Dr. Nandita. And this is the gray zone, you know, like, and it's controversial and we all come across this. So uh, this would be my last question. So the question is use of GLP-1 receptor analogs, which are presently approved in India for management of type 2 diabetes for treatment of obesity in pre-diabetic individuals and non-diabetic individuals. So we see that after the you know introduction of oral semaglutide, it is being given over the counter for treatment of management of obesity in a lot of patients who are non-diabetic. And this is happening across India, and we know that. So do we have any evidence of using these molecules in those cohort of patients where we, we know that the high doses of uh, oral semaglutide are being looked into now specifically for weight management and we are getting very encouraging data but with the doses that we have in place are we safe to use them for uh, only treating obesity in pre-diabetic or non-diabetic individuals and same is the question for the SGHQ inhibitors with the kind of geographic uh, benefits that we get but not in approved circumstances where the patient is coming with the background of CKD or heart failure but we know that it's established. So as, as you rightly said, oral semaglutide at higher doses is being studied. Now, a GLP-1 receptor agonist, I think we've all been using it off-label as well for obesity um, in India. In fact, I've used uh, even 3 milligram doses like 1.8 in the morning and 1.2 at night in certain select patients. And in fact, we've uh, witnessed some weight reduction. Uh, at pre-diabetes, of course, we've all spoken about the visceral fat. We've spoken about the subcutaneous fat. We need to understand the visceral fat is the most metabolically active fat. Now, when the visceral fat exceeds proportions, it's now being considered as adiposopathy. It itself is being recognized as a disease entity. Visceral fat is probably the root cause of metabolic diseases. Now, it triggers a lot of adipokines, which leads to metabolic diseases. So now using GLP-1 receptor agonist in obese person pre-diabetic reduces the visceral fat, reduces the patient's body weight, of course, could preclude or delay overt diabetes. Definitely, it is possible by literature references also as the data that we have. Now, SGLT2 inhibitors, we do see a lot of glycosuria in patients with diabetes, but it does reduce the renal threshold of glucosuria to about 110, 100. So it does knock out glucose, reducing weight. And very funnily, if you had seen Dr. T. Franzo, he said that the, you know, the renal threshold goes up to around 180 uh, and it comes down to okay. 40 actually. In, in those who, even who are non-diabetic individuals. So you're actually excreting a lot of glucose through right. urine right. And, uh, and basically that will give you pleiotrophic benefits. Uh, but my question is legally are we safe to use these molecules? And because we're doing this over the counter, is there the any chance? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I think to add on to what's already been uh, said, uh, one thing to keep in mind is both these are insulin sparing agents and so the risk of hypoglycemia is nil. So they act beyond the pancreatic, uh, you know, the beta cells. So the SGLT2 inhibitors have an independent mechanism of action. GLP-1, of course, do work, but in a glucose-dependent manner. So um, that being said, there's enough data, even with, uh, you know, DARPA and the DARPA CKD trial, there was a 30% reduction in the onset of type 2 diabetes in those, uh, you know, who were in the pre-diabetic stage. Uh, at the, that was an icing on, you know, sort of another um, um, extra benefit that they found at the end of the trial. So a, a surprise, in fact, that the, the um, trial that um, showed. So um, absolutely, yes. Both these groups of agents have literally been game changers in the management of diabetes. They provide pleiotropic benefits beyond glycemic control in terms of weight loss, uh, insulin sparing, so low risk of or nil risk of hypoglycemia, prevention of the risk of cardiovascular and renal complications. Uh, so why not? 
is the question. But are we legally safe is a different, uh, that, that I think is something that should be open to discretion of the doctor, treating sure. physician. So I think that would be a very good place to sort of conclude and, and a place to open up uh, discussions. Maybe one or two questions from the audience before we conclude. Because uh, they would be having their talk, so we'll keep it very brief. So if you want to make any comments or any, any, any queries, Yes, so when it comes to macronutrients, do you feel that calorie is not a calorie and each calorie is a different calorie? So calorie coming from glucose and calorie coming from fructose are different. Dr. Okay, Alok, you want to take this question? Maybe I'll just say this, I've not read it, uh, but then what I've understood is in your blood it is glucose, it is not fructose or maltose or galactose. So what is important here is a modified glycemic index of glycemic load versus glycemic index and it comes to that. So how you take that calorie is more important than what, how much you take. So suppose you take fruits for example, you're taking fructose, right? So if you're taking fructose, how you combine that fruit with your diet and how much you prolong the absorption and how your microbiota handles it and how much protein and fat you're overlaying and how much fiber you're putting by the time it gets absorbed is what finally the body will see. Rather than uh, seeing that uh, what we say that fruits are good and you know this is good or that is bad, ultimately it is how you take which is more important rather than what you take to give you calories. So I don't think calories will depend on whether you take fructose or galactose because your body will be dealing with glucose not fructose and galactose. So it's more relevant what is absorbed rather than how much you're taking. Of course, how much is important, but I think more relevant is how much you take. And that is something, a better way to handle this. So uh, there's on one hand, there's a lot of propagation that non-glucose substances are very good versus glucose. So that's like sort of promoting a junk diet in a, in a way. At the same time, it is it's also said that you can take gulab jamuns, you can take something, you know, you can make life pleasant for a patient provided you load in a bit salads and all. And here I'd like to allude to one trial which was recently published by Anup sir, Dr. Anup Bishra. He showed something very beautiful last session which I attended. If you take 10 or 15 uh, uh, almonds before you take the meal, the fasting sugar comes on by 46 mg, HbA1c comes on by 0.8 phenomenal. Just by taking 10 or 15 almonds before each meal. And he said when you load with salads and all, it forms a meshwork around the duodenum and the intestines and prevents absorption and delays it for a very long time. Oh, then I, think, I think to summarize the point is we need to have a proper representation of carbs, proteins, fibers, etc. in our diet. The reason to do that is that if it's only protein and we're deriving calories only from the protein, we know that there are certain you know uh, problems that arise out of it. Say ketogenic diet, we know the limitations of a ketogenic diet. So if you want to pursue this for a long time, we need to have a balance, you know, like so we have to have in Indian diet, we know that the representation of carb is way more than the Western diet. So it's about 60 to 70% of the plate, whereas recommended is around 30 to 40%. So if that balance is not there, then there becomes an issue. And I also agree that if you're having protein along with carbohydrate, you know, then for the second meal, this is called a second meal effect. So you'll see the rise of the blood sugar post prandial you know, the mage or the excursion of blood glucose post the second meal is much less if you have protein with the first meal. So you have to combine. So if you had only carbs, for example, you would see a much higher mage with the second meal. Right. So I was talking in reference to glucose and fructose. Mm. So what I believe is that fructose is the main culprit behind obesity rather than glucose. So fructose is the poison for a body. Glucose, of course, it is harmful. But then fructose is the poison. So it is only metabolized in the liver. Nowhere else in the body, fructose is metabolized. So if you take more fructose, rather more fruit juice, not fruits, fruit juice, it is very, very harmful. Any comments? So I think, I think we agree to the fact that you cannot ask the patient to have fruits because if you're actually, if the person is having the whole fruit, they're also consuming some amount of fiber as well. So that is definitely recommended. I will get back to you. I'm not very sure. We'll look up the data regarding uh, the effect of fructose versus glucose in particular, whether it does more harm as compared to glucose. Uh, fructose does more harm to the uh, organs as compared to 
Good, good. I don't uh, know if you have any data regarding that. But... I just want to make a quick comment on on the pharmacotherapy. If we just have one minute, and I would like everybody in the house also to give their thoughts. See, we keep on discussing about the GLP ones and the GIB ones as the cornerstone of pharmacotherapy. But you will see a lot of our patients with obesity will also be suffering from binge eating disorder and they will be having depression. And one such molecule which is available in our country is Biprobidol and also Fenteramid and also Topiramid. Topiramid is also used. So just kind of a, since it's a panel, uh, an experience share from anybody here in the house that, you know, how's your experience with these three molecules? Because I've used it on, but you need to be very selective on the patient population. If you're sure your patient is suffering from a binge eating disorder and is having depression, then a molecule like bupropion works very well. I've had a patient who's lost about more than just 7% of the body weight just because of bupropion itself. Also, the patient was also on topiramin added on later on. So, any experience from any one of you of using these molecules as additional? Unfortunately, we don't have the combinations. We don't have combinations. We have to use but them separately. Yeah, but it's separate. works. It works, yes. It works, yeah. It's Sorry to see the time, but just one point I wanted to add over here. Not for we will try and conclude now because the next sessions are uh, in, in place. We can take the, up these questions in person after this and over a coffee or something. I'll let you finish your point. Well, I just wanted to say start using AI more often. I have found it CGM and AI. In my own, I mean, the champion is sitting here, but when you show them in live on the screen, this is what Chat GPT has shown. You know, you can do it actually generates. Prescriptions for you if you're capable of giving the right, uh, you know, commands to the chat GPT. It works wonders. You know. The patient carries on with it. He follows it. it. You get a much better idea. I call that as patient empowerment through official sources rather than getting empowered through non-official sources on the net. And I found it doing wonderful. It handles a lot of my counseling beautifully. Just just one point to be added so that we can be more AI savvy and get better results. So, so the, the concept here is there's something called nudge theory. The nudge theory means that if you're tapping the patient at the right point of time with the right behavioral modification command, then the outcome that you're going to get is better. Now all of us treating obesity know that the patients are mostly lost to follow up. Either because they lose the motivation or because they don't find it driving enough to continue with the diet or the lifestyle changes or even come back for, for a post-pediatric surgery follow-up. So this is where actually tech and AI is going to help us because it's going to kind of, you know, tap the patient at the right time to give better outcomes. So the next so we are AI in most symposium for us in the next yes. meeting so, we'll try to give it. Yes. I have yeah. no comment here, but I wanted the panel to thank Dr. Supruti for conducting it so beautifully, yeah. designing fantastic questions, so and making a story out of the whole discussion. Yeah. Very wonderfully moderated. So much. And thanks to Dr. Rajmendra, Dr. Dutul, Dr. Bansi, and the entire team of PhD for, for this opportunity. And we look forward to you connecting with us regarding whoever has interest in metabolic obesity medicine. Please feel free to join us. We'll be opening membership for Amos as well. Yes, we all are part of Amos family and would just, you know, have a, a group photo with the memento for all our panelists to conclude the session.